So our next speaker is a software engineer for 20 plus years, which I'm sure you already know, and book writer and founder of Code Scene. And his best-selling book is Your Code is a Crime Scene. So instead of talk, we will be most likely solving a Mr. Murder Mystery, and we start from Your Code Repository. No, just kidding. Please welcome on stage Adam Thornhill. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on the business impact of code quality. And we're going to cover a lot of ground today. So I like to approach this topic from the perspective of technical debt. So technical debt is kind of interesting because we're all familiar with it, right? And we take on technical debt for various reasons. The most common reason, the one I hear most often, is that you know, we want to deliver a feature a little bit quicker, so we try to kind of cut some corners, compromise quality. Ever seen that happen? Yeah, super common, right? But what's also interesting is that sometimes we actually do the right thing. But then our understanding of the problem we're trying to solve kind of shifts, and our original design is no longer a good fit. Or maybe, just maybe, that design wasn't a good fit to start with. Whatever the root cause, we end up with code that's more expensive to maintain than it should be. And that's the definition of technical debt that I'm going to run with throughout this presentation. Over the past years, there has been some really interesting research on technical debt and its impact on our business and our organization. And you will see different numbers depending on which paper you read. But at the end, it doesn't really matter, because what all these papers have in common is that they're a pretty depressing read. Because it turns out that we developers, on average, waste 23 to 42 percent of our time dealing with consequences of technical debt and bad code in general. 42 percent waste, what does that even mean? Let's do a little bit of a thought experiment together here. So let's pretend that we have a business and we have uh, 100 software engineers in that organization. With a 42% waste, it means that I'm paying the salaries for 100 people, but I get the equivalent output of just 58 people. I'm not a business person, but it sure doesn't sound like a good deal to me, does it? Right? It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And to make it even worse, if we can build the same system with 58 people as we could with 100, then the smaller team, that's always going to be much more efficient. Because with 100 people, we have all the additional management overhead, communication overhead, and coordination overhead. So I actually like to think that these numbers, they're overly optimistic once we factor that in. However, technical debt doesn't stop with just the financial waste. There has been some other pretty interesting research that points out that there is a strong correlation between security vulnerabilities, and some major code smells like brain classes, complex implementations, stuff that we're going to cover later today. So my point is that if we have something like bad code, technical debt, and we know that it causes a huge financial waste, it puts us at risk for security vulnerabilities, then you would expect technical debt to be really, really high on any decision maker's agenda. Is that what's happening today? No, not really, right? In fact, this has also been well studied, and it turns out that we developers were frequently forced to introduce even more technical debt as companies keep trading quality for short-term gains like new features. And I try to understand why is this happening? Why are we making these trade-offs all the time? And I think we can see why by looking into something called the loss of software evolution. So before I continue, how many of you are familiar with the loss of software evolution? Not so many. That's really good. I got something new for you today. Cool. So there are several laws, but I really just want to focus on the two most relevant for our, our case here. And the first law is the law of continuing change. So the law of continuing change means that we have to continuously adapt and evolve our software, or it will become progressively less useful over time. Right? Is this something you recognize? 
Yeah, definitely, right? This is where our backlogs are never empty, right? We always have to keep our products up to date. We might have to respond to customer needs. We might even have to respond to competitors, right? So a successful software project is never done. What I wanted to do now is to note that there is some kind of tension, some kind of conflict to the second law of software evolution. And that's the law of increasing complexity. And this law claims that when we evolve our software systems, they become increasingly more complicated unless we actively try to reduce that complexity. And it's very easy to see how ending up with an increasing complexity leads us to become slower and slower when responding to change. But what's even more interesting is that when we look at the feedback timing here, we see that the feedback loop for our change to our software means a quick reward, right? The moment we take a new feature and we put it into production, we get some happy users, or maybe at least some less angry ones, right? We might win a new contract, all these good things. However, contrast that with the feedback from increasing complexity. This is something we might notice after months, maybe even years, and by then it might be too late. So technical depth simply means a slow death. And the problem here is that this difference in feedback timing is like an open invitation to a decision-making bias known as hyperbolic discounting. So hyperbolic discounting, it's a, it's a really fascinating concept. It basically means that we humans, we make choices today that our future selves are going to regret. To give you a very specific and contextual example, let's say that you go to the after party today and you decide to have that extra drink despite knowing that you have an important meeting first thing in the morning, right? That's hyperbolic discounting at work. Hyperbolic discounting is frequently used within psychology to explain ad addiction, things like substance abuse. It's also, coincidentally, the best description I have ever found on why companies make such a poor job at managing technical debt. Because just like the addict, we kind of keep trading our future well-being of a healthy, sustainable code basis for the lure of the next quick fix and short-term reward. Or, to put it differently, in the words of Mel Conway, somehow there's never enough time to do something right, but there's always enough time to do it over and over again. So the question is, how can we kind of escape this vicious circle of short-term rewards? I think the main challenge we're in for here is that code is something very abstract. Software code lacks visibility. So I think that the first thing we would need to do is to shine a light on software. We need to visualize code so that we can make it tangible and start to have conversations around it. And this, of course, brings us to the next challenge. I mean, visualize. How do we visualize a thing like code complexity or even code quality? Is there even such a thing? I have to admit that I personally dislike the word code quality because it kind of suggests an absolute, whereas reality is way, way more complicated as we're going to see throughout this session. And in fact, this is well supported by a paper that I highly recommend. It's an old paper by now, but I've taken so much inspiration from this paper. And this paper basically says that when it comes to a multifaceted and complicated concept like code quality or code complexity, then we are doomed if we look for a single metric to capture a multifaceted space like that. So what I've been doing instead is that I've taken a lot of inspiration from this second paragraph that says that a much more promising approach is to measure separate aspects of code complexity, right? And then we can kind of combine them and we can get this more holistic picture. So this is something I've been working on for the past five, maybe six years now. It's a concept I call code health. And I want to walk you through it high level so you know what's actually being measured once we get to actual results here. So code health is an aggregated metric and it's calculated at the file level. So what we do here is basically we take a piece of code and we parse it into a shared abstraction and then we run a number of checks on that parsed code. 
And those checks are used to detect various code smells. And those code smells come in multiple categories. And I just want to give you a couple of examples here. But if we look at the highest level, then it's about module level issues, module level smells. And one of the true classics there is low cohesion. So how many of you are familiar with low cohesion? It's like there are maybe 20-30% of the audience. Cool. So low cohesion in this context basically means that you stuff too many responsibilities into the same module, into the same file or class, right? And the problem with that is that now the code becomes hard to understand because when reading that code, you have to understand multiple domain concepts, right? Because they're all implemented in the same place. What's even worse about low cohesion is that it actually opens up the risk of things like unexpected feature interactions. And those are some of the worst bugs you can ever have. Of course, having a problem like low cohesion, that doesn't mean we cannot make it worse. We can take a module with low cohesion and turn it into a brain class. And brain class, as you see, not only does it have low cohesion, it's also a large class and it contains at least one brain method. So brain methods, they are a function level smell. Brain methods are also known as uh, gut functions. And we have all seen them. So you have seen a brain method if you have seen this large module because they're always long and large. They're overly complicated, so they contain a lot of tricky logic. And they tend to be central to the class that implements them in the sense that each time you want to change something related to that class, you end up in the brain method, right? And over time, they just grow more and more complicated. Then, of course, you have classics like copy-pasted logic, drive violations, and so on. And at the lowest level, we look for code smells like deeply nested logic. That's the example I want to go with. Deeply nested logic is interesting because it basically means you have the if statements, inside if statements, inside other if statements, and then maybe a while loop for good measure. Ever seen code like that? Yeah. The problem with that coding construct is that there is some pretty convincing research that points out that roughly 20% of our programming mistakes are due to constructs like deep nested logic. Right? So it's a pretty severe smell. It's also easy to avoid once we know about it. So anyway, just wanted to give you some examples. So what we do here is that we discover all these properties of the code. We see what we find, which smells do we detect. Then we score aggregate and categorize every single piece of code as being either green, yellow, or red. So green code, that's healthy code. And healthy doesn't mean perfect, it just means that this code is likely to be easy enough to understand for me as a developer, right? So I can pick it up, I can work with it with low risk. Yellow means that we have started to take on technical debt. The code is expensive to maintain, it's hard to understand. And unless we are really, really careful, we might end up in the red category. And the red category, that's code that's extremely hard to understand. And each time you touch it, you generate three, three new bugs, something like that, right? So now that we have this code elf concept defined, we can finally take on this challenge and start to visualize source code and code quality. And I want to show you an example from a real code base. So this is a code base that some of you might know about. This is uh, eForum, which is like a decentralized open source blockchain. And what you see on screen here is roughly 600,000 lines of code. And the way you read this visualization is that if you look at the screen, if you look at these circles that I'm hovering over right now, that each one of these circles, they represent the code in a specific Git repository. Because um, this code base consists of more than 50 Git repositories, right? So each one of these top-level circles run repo. If it was a monorepo, then each one of the top-level circles would be like a top-level folder. So it's a visualization that always follows the structure of your code. It's also interactive, so I can click on any one of these folders and zoom in on them. And once I do that, I reveal the various subfolders inside it, so you see, completely hierarchical. And once I get to the lowest level of detail, then I see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle too. And you see that these circles, they have different size, right? So the size of a circle just reflects the number of lines of code, right? So the larger the module, the larger the circle. 
So that's good. That gives us a chance to see how big a potential problem is. The important signal here is, of course, the color, which signals the code health. Right? So we see here that we have two green modules, two healthy modules, and one red unhealthy file. In general, I'm a big, big fan of visualizations because visualizations tap into one of the most powerful pattern detectors we have in the known universe, the human brain. And it makes it easy for us, once we visualize something, to spot pretty deep patterns that could take us months or even years to discover manually. So I want to show you an example by looking at two different code bases. And let's start with the one to the left. So the one to the left is React from uh, Facebook, or UI library. So it's a pretty popular application, and I think actually a lot of you might be using React today to build your user interfaces. If I look at the code health visualization, I see that React seems to consist of all, yeah, there's plenty of green code in it, which is good, but there's also a lot of yellow code. And if this is, would be my code base, what I would be concerned about is this cluster, this circle of red code that you have inside a module called the React Reconciler. So if this is my code base, something I'm working on, then I need to know about that because as we will see soon, that red code in the React Reconciler is going to constrain what we can do with the code base. Another advantage of visualizing code is that we can easily compare different code bases. And we can contrast React with the code base to the right. So who in the audience runs a laptop with Windows on it? Ah, cool. So let's peek under the hood. This is the core CLR, the common, the, uh, the .NET runtime. So as you see here, first of all, core CLR is a massive code base. So what you see on screen is actually eight and a half million lines of code. So there's a lot of code. And if you look at the color, you see that it looks like there's a lot of red code, right? There's like this band of red code. It's like a, this looks like a bacteria culture, right? Like a petri dish gone mad or something. But it's not. It's just a lot of unhealthy code. And it's, of course, questionable. What do I do with this information? Do I start to refactor formula lines of code? Towards the end of this session, I'm going to show you the techniques I use to address highly complicated code bases like that. For now, I hope I managed to explain how we can not only measure code health and use that as a proxy for code quality, but also kind of visualize it and start to get the language that makes it possible to communicate around these things. So what I want to do now is to see, can we connect these code health categories to some kind of business outcome? And the reason I think this is important is because I spent three decades in the software industry. And during those three decades, everyone, everyone I ever spoke to kind of agreed that code quality is important. But it's always about knowing that code quality is important because no one ever had any data to support that statement. So what I want to do now is that I want us to remove the quotation marks and see if we can actually get some data on it. So with that mission in mind, me and our colleague, Mr. Marcus Borg, we set out a year and a half ago by collecting data from a lot of different companies. So we collected the data from 39 different companies. And we made sure to pick companies that worked in various domains because we wanted to make sure that whatever we find, it's something that generalizes across industries. So we had everything from data analytics companies, cloud providers, retailing industry, everything. And for that same reason, we also made sure to include examples of code written in 14 different programming languages, because again, we wanted to make sure that our findings are general and not specific to something. So we had code in uh, C Sharp, C++, JavaScript, Java, Python, Go, all the big ones, right? And of course, each one of these companies, they had multiple code bases, so we had many, many million lines of code to analyze. And I want to point out that the actual research paper here that I'm going to quote is, uh, is, has been peer-reviewed. It was presented at the International Conference on Technical Debt. So the findings you see here, they're actually statistically significant, meaning it's not just a fluke. So with that covered, there's one more thing I need to tell you. Because what we did now was that we uh, 
calculate the code health of every single module in these systems. But we also needed something for the business outcome. And what we decided to do was to use the time in development. That is, how long does it take me as a developer to implement a feature or fix a bug in a piece of code, depending on which color it has. And we also wanted to make sure that we kind of avoid pu to put some administrative burden upon the developers because no one really likes to fill in time spent in Jira or something like that. We really wanted to avoid that. So we want to automate it to take away that bias. So what we did was this. Basically, the moment you take our task in Jira or Rasha DevOps or whatever we're using, and you pull that task into an in-progress state, that's where we start the clock. Then at some point, you make a commit, and in that commit message, you make a reference to the ticket you work on. That's where we stop the clock. And if you're done with the task now, then the time in development for that file was from task movement in progress until the commit was done. Of course, for most interesting tasks, you will typically have multiple commits. So what we did in that case was that we just continued to count the time in development as measured by time between commits. And at the end, we simply summed it up for every single file. So now we had a data set with uh, thousands of files with a known code health, with a known time in development. And since we had access to Jira, we also looked at, okay, how many defects have been reported and fixed in each file. So we also knew the number of defects. And that made it possible to finally answer this question. Does code quality really matter? Spoiler, yes it does, otherwise it would be a very short talk. So, the first thing we looked at was how does code quality impact the speed to market as measured in time and development. And what we found was really, really interesting. It turned out that implementing a feature or fixing a bug in green code is more than twice as quick compared to red code. Is that important to a business? Well, it probably should be because what this means is that if our company, if we would have had red code and we can implement a certain capability in two and a half months, then our competitors, given that they have green code, they can get the same thing in just one month. It's going to be virtually impossible to keep up. So green code is a massive business advantage. It allows you to deliver quicker. That said, this is actually, I, I didn't knew the precise numbers, but this is actually something I would have suspected, right? And most of you probably as well. What I didn't suspect was the next thing we found. Because we kind of recognized that averages can be a little bit misleading, so what we did instead was to look at the variation. What's the longest time it can take to implement a feature based on the code health? And what we found was this. It's pretty interesting, right? And you don't really see the actual numbers on the y-axis. They're really hard to see. But I can reveal that the maximum time it takes to implement a task in green code is very, very close to its average. And you see that for red code, all bets are off. It can actually take an order of magnitude longer. And what this means to me, my take on it, is that this signals uncertainty, right? In green code, where everything thinks roughly the same time, it simply means that the task in green code is predictable. In red code, where all bets are off, this can put the business in some massive, massive challenges. So right now, I happen to, just to give you an example, right now I happen to work as a CTO. And as a CTO, one of the things I do all the time is to give promises, right? Like, yeah, I can tell my sales team that, you know, yeah, we're going to have this feature in one month's time. If we would have red code, I could never, ever make such a promise because it could as well take nine or ten months. And that would make me look really, really bad, right? If I instead put on my developer hat, because I still write a lot of code, I still enjoy it, then I also dislike red code because this uncertainty is what's causing me stress over time and miss deadlines. No organization likes to live with uncertainty, and red code is causing a lot of it. Now, 
the last research finding I wanted to share with you right now is that, as you remember, we had access to Jira, so we actually knew if a particular task was a new feature or if it was a bug fix. So what we did was that we correlated that to the code elf. How many of you think that red code might be a little bit more buggy than green code? Ah, you see where this is heading, don't you? These are the results. It turns out that unhealthy red code has on average 15 times more defects than green code. Is that important to a business? It probably should be, because that number of defects, there are two problems with it. The first is that a lot of defects is going to hurt the product maturity experience, right? Your customers are not going to be happy when you continue to ship bugs. And that's a problem in itself, but what's even worse is that bugs have this property that you know, just like in the old Stephen King movies, they come back. And they come back in the shape of unplanned work. An unplanned word, work is, as Jin Kim called it, it's the silent killer of an IT project. Right? So red code is disastrous to a business. However, if we instead look at technical depth from a developer perspective, then things might start to look a little bit different. Because after all, being a developer today means being in demand, right? There's a global shortage of developers. And if someone chooses to waste 42% of our time, it just means that we become even more in demand. So one could make the case that technical debt is a developer's best friend, right? It drives up our salaries. You seem very skeptical, and you should be. Of course, no developer likes technical debt. No developer likes bad code. And the reason I can say this with confidence is that I recently read this uh, wonderful book called Rethinking Productivity in Software Engineering, it's a really, really good book. I highly recommend you get it. Last time I checked, it was actually free on Kindle. And this book is basically a collection of research papers. And there's one study in that book in particular that I found uh, super interesting. And it's a study that looked at what makes developers happy. Is it enough that we get that ping pong table in the cafeteria? Most of the time, not. And in fact, they highlighted that by kind of turning the problem on its head and presenting the three main issues that we developers become unhappy. And I want to show those three reasons for you here. So the number one thing we developers dislike is being stuck in problem solving. And given what we just talked about, about the business impact of code quality, it's very easy to see how this kind of fits together. Because let's pretend that we work at the same company. And we attend a daily stand-up, and uh, someone tells us that, you know, we have a problem. We had a production crash this morning, and we need to fix it immediately. You volunteer to fix it, because you're vaguely familiar with that area, so you think you're going to be able to solve it pretty quickly. So you jump into the code. Pretty soon, you have found that you have kind of drifted into this yellow and reddish code, right? And now, all bets are off you're going to struggle a lot with understanding that code. You're stuck in problem solving. As a consequence of the uncertainty inherent in red code, you're now going to get into time pressure because what you thought you could fix, you know, during a morning before a lunch break, now ends up taking 10 days. So not only is it stressful to, for you because you still haven't found what caused that production crash, it's also stressful for the organization because, hey, we have a production crash. And I think this is the main reason why we developers dislike to work with bad code. And I really love this quote here from that paper where it said that we developers, we suffer tremendously when we meet bad code that could have been avoided in the first place. And that's like the textbook definition of technical debt. So how would we use this data? Now that you've heard about this, what can we do differently next week? I would like to share a couple of use cases that I have found uh, work well for me, that I found super useful. The first use case is that we have to realize that code quality is constraining our business. And unless we keep our code healthy, it's going to be really, really hard to respond to the needs of the business. 
So I think the most important thing we can do is to give all stakeholders, not only us engineers and developers, but also people from product and from higher level management, we need to give them situational awareness of where are the strong parts in our code base and where are the weak parts, right? And the reason this is important because you fight hyperbolic discounting by priming decision makers to think about the, the potential risks in the future. So one thing you can do is uh, you can pull up a visualization like that the next time you have a planning meeting. So you sit down with your product people, perhaps some other stakeholders, and you see that, yeah, we have this um, big, large planned capability that we want to add to, in this example, to the React Reconciler. And we see that we have all this red and yellow code there. So now we know that this might actually take us an order of magnitude longer to implement. So one thing we could do is we can actually plan with that in mind and say that, yeah, this might actually take much longer. Or even better, we can use that as a driver to start to refactor the code so we can implement the planned features safely. And this is actually what I like the most about the Code Red research, that it makes it possible for us to do a, make a business case for refactoring. Because refactorings can now actually come with a business expectation. We can promise, based on statistically significant data, that if we have this piece of red code, or even yellow code, and we spend time refactoring it, and we turn it green, then we can expect that all these features we have queued up in the roadmap that touches that area, each one of them will be implemented on average twice as quick, with an order of magnitude less uncertainty in estimates, and a significant reduction in the number of bugs. How sweet isn't that? So, there's one more thing I would like to cover before we take questions, and that is that I promised to talk about this. Remember CoreCLR, right? Lots of red code. Again, what you see on screen is more than 8 million lines of code. So each one of these red bubbles, they probably consist of uh, tens or 20,000 lines of red code. So there's a lot of red code. And the thing is that we, we cannot just, you know, stop everything we're doing. We cannot stop delivering features for like two years. Because remember the law of continuing change. If we don't deliver a feature in two years and just spend time rewriting our code, you know, we would probably be out of business. We would be Netscape, right? So we need to find a balance. And how can we find that balance? The techniques I've been using is something I call a behavioral code analysis. And a behavioral code analysis is different from a traditional code analysis. Because in a behavioral code analysis, the code is important. It's clearly important to know if we are green, yellow, or red code. But it's even more important to know how we, as a development team, interact with the code we're building. And to pull off a behavioral code analysis, we obviously need some behavioral data on developers. And this sounds a little bit scary. It sounds like a surveillance, doesn't it? But it's not, because we already have all the data we need. We call it version control. So our version control system, it's a wonderful data source. And for this particular purpose of identifying refactoring opportunities and prioritizing them, what's most interesting is that our version control system actually gives us a time dimension. It gives us a timeline into our code. So this is something we can use to prioritize technical debt. And this is a concept that I call uh, hotspots. I remember I spoke about this when I last visited the uh, wonderful Budapest. And hotspots is about change frequencies. So what we do is that we look at the version control. How often do we work with each piece of code? How often do we do a commit to that piece of code? We can use the same type of visualization, but now the colors carry a different meaning. They show change frequency. And the reason this is interesting is because it gives us a way to prioritize the high impact code quality issues from the low impact quality issues. So what you see here in the example with Core CLR is that most of that code is actually stable. So it means it's code that's rarely, if ever, touched. What we also see is that most of the development activity seems to be in a pretty small package there, right? So you have this band of red hotspots. This package is the JIT package, the just-in-time uh, package. 
And what's interesting is that we now took this massive 8 million lines of code, code base and narrow it down to just one package, right, where we know that any code quality issues we find in here, they are high impact because we work on them all the time. So we know they're relevant. However, the problem now is that if we look at the number one hotspot here, we see that it's a file with 14,000 lines of code. Who would like to refactor that file? <laughs> not, not so many of you, that's good, that's really good. Because it's not only 14,000 lines of fire code, it's actually 14,000 lines of C++ that looks like this. And I have to tell you, I mean, I mean actually, I've been a C++ developer. I wrote C++ for 10 years, and I know exactly what you're thinking. It's 10 years and never get back. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. But that's not the reason I mention it. I mention it because I have a lot of respect for this type of code, right? Also, on a side, as a side note, I'm not really jealous that the archaeologist of the future this is going to be a hard nut to crack than even the hieroglyphs. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. What I want to point out is that we cannot just jump at this and start to refactor all this code. So what I do in this case is that you use another behavior code analysis technique called the X-ray. So what I do here is that I take this large piece of code, I parse it into separate functions, and then I look at my git log, where do each commit hit over time, and I sum it up, and I get hotspots at the function level. Let's look at the examples from this particular hotspot called gentry.cpp. So these are the x-ray results. And what I get now is basically a prioritized list over in which order should I refactor this code. And the number one hotspot at the function level is a function called gt clone expression. We can see in this table that the team have made 42 commits that touched that function just over the past year. So almost once a week, some developers impacted by these findings. We can also see in the column to the very right, it's a column called cyclomatic complexity. So who's familiar with cyclomatic complexity? Oh, a lot of you, like half of you, cool. So cyclomatic complexity is one of these old school complexity metrics. It's not a particularly good complexity metric. But the way it works for the rest of you, it's basically that you count the number of uh, logical paths for a function. So each time you have if statement plus one, each time you have a loop plus one, and so on, and you sum it up. And the cutoff point for when it's considered to be very high complexity is at 15. Here you have 112. That's quite a lot, isn't it? The reason I use cyclomatic complexity, despite it not being a particularly good complexity metrics, is because cyclomatic complexity is very good at one thing. It's very good at estimating the minimum number of unit tests you need to cover just that function. So it would need 112 unit tests. That sure says something about its complexity. In any case, we also see it's a pretty large function, this GT clone expression, with more than 500 lines of code. That's a lot for a single function, isn't it? It is, it is. But, and here's the beauty of it, 500 lines of code is much less than 14,000 lines of code, which was size of the total file. And 500 lines is definitely less than 8 million lines of code, which was the total code base. So more important, we are now at the level where we can go into the code and we can make a focused refactoring based on data from how we, as an organization, have worked with the code. And we can get some very real results. So the reason I like hotspots is because they give us this ability to prioritize. Hotspots basically tell us that code quality matters in context. We don't have to fix all technical debt at once. And you can see that in this graph. So on the x-axis, you have each file in uh, core CLR, and they're sorted by the exchange frequency, the number of commits, which we'll see on the y-axis. And as you see here, I actually just zoomed in on a small part of the curve. There's a super long tail on this curve. And as you see, most of the code is in the long tail. And this is actually something I've seen on every single system I've ever analyzed, and I probably looked at 400 code bases by now. So this seems the way software evolves. It evolves according to power law. And it's important because the code in the long tail, even if we had red or yellow code, I mean, it's important for us to know about it because it's a future risk if we ever start to work with it. But right now, it's technical debt with zero interest, right? It's low interest tech debt. 
Whereas any technical debt or code quality issues at the head of the curve, that's like the technical debt equivalent of an SMS loan or something, right? This is high interest tech debt. So this is the parts where we would have zero tolerance against yellow or red code. So what I wanted to show you today is that it's actually possible to take a data-driven approach towards technical depth and code quality. And to do that, you need two different perspectives. One is the quality dimension that separates good from bad, and the other one is the relevance dimension, so you know, okay, what's the impact of these findings. And finally, what I wanted to point out is that over the years, I had so many managers that I worked for that told me, no, no, we don't have time to refactor. No, we don't have time to rethink the architecture. No, we don't have time to automate tests. And it's almost like there is this perception that there is some kind of trade-off between uh, speed and quality. But what we see in the code da red data is actually that there is no such trade-off. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. If we want to go really, really fast, then we also need to have high quality code. And with that covered, I would like to give you a couple of references if you want to dive deeper into this topic. So if you want to read up on these findings, then I have uh, two papers here. The first one is a white paper that's a little bit more accessible. It's like an executive summary of all these findings. The second paper is the formal research publication, so that's the one you read if you want to know, okay, how did they analyze the data, what does all these different biases, what do we, did we control for, all that stuff. To perform the data collection and to um, visualize the code, uh, we use the CodeSyn tool. So CodeSyn is available at CodeSyn.com, so if you enjoy this presentation, please take a look at CodeSyn. And finally, if you would like to try this in your day job, then you might want to check out the new Visual Studio Code extension, which can actually calculate code health in real time. And finally, a small announcement. I have a second edition of Your Code is a Crime Scene coming up in just one month's time. And there I'm going to cover a lot of this stuff together with some possible refactorings and remedies. So before I take question, let me just take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me, and may the code be with you. Thank you. Absolutely fabulous talk, Adam. Thank you so much. We have three minutes for questions, so may the most upvoted ones win. All right, we have some. 17 questions we will not be able to cover, so you will find Adam and invite him for a drink. Um, is Cerner Cube a competitor of CodeScene? Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't, think, don't think it is. Uh, we solve uh, very, very different problems. Uh, what we do differently at CodeScene is that we make sure that all metrics we have, they're actually validated, so we know that they actually work. So uh, I like to think that the tools are quite different. I happy to continue that conversation over a beer this evening. Let's work on our hyperbolic discounting. All right, thank you. Do you think it is software developers' fault for allowing technical debt to appear and accumulate by shifting decision making to managers or POs? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that we as developers, we have a certain responsibility, of course, right? But most of us developers, we really, really want to do the right thing. I think if we developers are to blame for anything, it is that uh, we might so sometimes underestimate how hard it is to communicate around something as technical as code. Because let's face it, most of the time, we, at least I, I struggle myself to understand source code. And it's really, really hard to expect someone that might not write code themselves to understand it. So I think that one thing we need to do is to uh, help non-technical decision makers get insights into our otherwise inaccessible world of code. Great, thank you. The problem never was lack of explanation and why red code is costly, but lack of decision makers approval. How to convince them? Is there anything else? Oh, I thought I just covered that. Uh, so let me try to clarify. So like I said, uh, the reason we did this code red study was because we have been talking about code quality and its importance for decades but no one ever had any data whatsoever to show that uh, code quality is actually beneficial to business. 
we all kind of knew about it implicitly, right? We knew it in our stomach, but no one could show any data. So I like to think that that's one of the most important contributions that we can actually now quantify the business impact. So decision makers no longer have to just kind of trust our gut feeling, right? They can actually see in real numbers that take this red code, turn it green, these are all the benefits you're going to get. And I've been fortunate to uh, work with a lot of uh, decision makers over the past years. And uh, I have found that just sitting down with that data and giving them a walkthrough and an explanation, it's something that they highly appreciate because they also want to do the right thing for the company. So I hope that helps and I hope I managed to clarify. I think last but not least, what tool was used to visualize code health? Uh, that was the code scene tool that we used for the visualization. The actual visualization type is called an enclosure diagram. It's something I use a lot in my books and talks and tooling. All right, and I think we are out of time and there is gonna be a very short break. So let's thank you, Adam, for this wonderful talk. Thank you.